Hello, hello everyone. Happy Thursday and happy release party Thursday. I'm pumped to see how many people are already in the chat and looking forward to this release party. Um, if you are familiar with these, you kind of already know what's going to go down. Um, but for those of y'all who this is your first release party, these are always really fun because we get people from the VS Code team who actually worked on these features to showcase some of the cool things with the release. Um, so this release went out last Thursday, I believe. Um, so there's a good chance, hopefully, you all have been able to play around with some of these new features. Um, but if not, we're going to highlight some of the really cool ones. Um, so let's see what's going on in chat here. Um, we got Ben Rogers staying up late. Thank you. I know that this is a really inconvenient time for some people, but we love seeing people tune in no matter what time it is. Can I get soda for the party? Man, we should really make like a special like VS Code like release party drink or food that everyone can just do at the same time and just brand it and like our own little popcorn stand or something. That's a great idea. It's probably not going to happen because that's a lot of drinks to buy. But I love I love the enthusiasm. Uh, we got some people saying hello. Hey, Takano32. And yeah, heck yeah, it's going to be a party. We got some cool people on today. Um, some people that I think you will recognize if you come on these live streams regularly. Um, and I actually love this. Okay, so David said, my guess is for today's party, there's going to be the new code action UI, settings profiles, and Jupyter notebook improvements. So I love when y'all make these predictions, because obviously I know what's already going to be happening. Um, but drop what you think we're going to be seeing today, because you're either going to be right and get that satisfaction, or you get the opportunity to kind of, you know, plus one your favorite features from this release. So definitely drop those guesses in here. Ooh, nice prediction. Okay. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. You, you're, in, you're in for a treat, I think. All right. Oh, you know, I was wondering when someone was going to um, mention my books. I do have a lot of books on my bookshelf. They're mostly all from college when I didn't realize that buying textbooks is a scam and you should just rent them. But now I have them all. So it's like from years and years ago. <laughs> so lots of stuff going on there. All right. We got lots of good energy here. Um, I am going to go ahead and kick us off with something we've been doing on previous release parties. And that is to say a big thank you to all of our contributors. Um, if you're not familiar with VS Code, it's completely open source. Um, so we definitely rely a lot on contributions from various people in our community um, to help with issue tracking, creating pull requests and things like that. Um, so producer, if you want to throw up my screen and I can do a good thank you for everyone who definitely deserves it. Um, so these can be found at the bottom of our release notes. Um, this whole section dedicated to everyone who has helped us. So people have helped us with issue tracking, a bunch of different pull requests for contributions to the VS Code repo, to the VS Code extension samples, and to our dev container CLI. Um, so I wish I could kind of, you know, one by one name every single one of you, but it's a long list. But I speak for the entire team. Thank you all so much for doing this because we cannot do this without you. And every release really is special because we do have these contributions from the community. So thank you all. Okay, so, oh, here's one question. Please make a short video like last time covering all the new features. Um, we do always every month put out a release highlight short that will be coming out this week. Um, and that goes on our YouTube channel and our TikTok channel. Um, so we'll throw up those links at the end so you can subscribe to that. Um, but that's a great plug. We do have just a very rapid fire, 60 seconds or less of some of the highlights. So that way you can really quickly see what those look like. Okay. Oh, this is, okay. This is just a side note. Good morning from Charleston, West Virginia. I'm in Charleston, South Carolina. So I'm from the other Charleston. So <laughs> hello from one Charleston to another. Okay. So without further ado, we had a lot of guests, guesses in here, something about Markdown support. We had David's original guesses. So let's go ahead and kick off with what we will be seeing in today's release party. And the first guest that we have is someone who I think you all will recognize. He's one of my favorite people at Microsoft. And I'm not just saying that because he's my manager. Um, so without further ado, let's bring on Burke to see what he's going to be demoing. Hey, what's up, Olivia? <laughs> hey, Burke. <laughs> How's it going? Good. I like the uh, disclaimer there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just being transparent there. 
compelled by political forces to say it. Exactly. Hey, chat, how's it going? Hey, listen, full disclosure, my internet is down. So I'm coming to you live from an LTE connection. I put my phone very close to the window though. So I'm confident we can get through this. Okay. Today. I think, but, I think we'll be good. The demo gods are with us today. I think that's right. What am I doing? Why am I here? Remind Why me are you here? I don't know, Bert. What, what you got for us today? Well, so chat, Often what happens with these releases is that there's a lot in them and we spend a lot of time covering things in these release parties that are substantial enough to give you five, six, seven, eight minute demos. But there's a ton of stuff that gets through there that's like real quick that we don't really talk about unless you follow us on TikTok or YouTube. In that case, we do talk about this stuff. Um, but what we thought we would do is a segment called The Little Things to just show y'all some of the things from the last three or four releases that you may have missed because we didn't make a very big deal about them, but they're they're very cool. Uh, and so, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Okay, let's do it. A little rapid fire lightning round. Let's do it. All right. So um, bring my screen up. Perfect. All right, so the first one that I wanted to show y'all is something that we shipped um, quite a while ago, and it's called custom folding. So in VS Code, you can fold here, and VS Code uh, will sort of auto-determine what you can fold, right? So you can fold this if statement, you can fold the class. Um, and for a while, you've been able to create custom folding by, I don't know if y'all know this, but you can create a region um, fold all this, right? And then you can just fold, say we wanted to fold everything in here and then uh, end, end region. Uh, and then you can fold that entire region, right? So I don't know if you know that you can do that, but you can do that. Um, but we released a new feature in, I think it was two releases ago that lets you create a custom folding region, right? So if we were to just select all of this here, and then open the command palette and say, create um, create manual folding range from selection. It will just fold everything like we just did, except for we don't need the region tags, right? So we've now created this manually folding region that just folds all of this stuff here. Now, what's interesting about this is that I believe, I don't even think, so I, we don't have to say this, and I'm pretty sure VS Code remembers this. That's what I was going to ask. It does, yes. So when you come back, it remembers that custom folding region. So you can do that now. You can create these custom folding regions without ever actually having to use that region syntax. Nice. So that's cool. one of the things. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. Um, what else? Well, real quick, I want to, because I yeah. feel like some people might not know that VS Code does this, and this isn't like a release thing, but the way that you're getting the letters to pop up on your screen can you show them when you're typing? Oh, Can you yeah, show them how you're doing that? That's a great question. So that's called screencast mode. Screencast mode. So you just toggle that on and off just so you can see my what keys I'm pressing here. And you get the little circle on my cursor. Yes, I love that. So just a quick, that's not a new release. It's been in VS Code for a while. But just wanted to do that because it's so cool, especially if you're someone who demos things a lot. Um, it's super helpful to have. Yes, it is great. Uh, okay, another quick thing is that a couple releases ago, we released this toggle between light and dark themes. So you can now toggle between your light and dark themes just like this. Um, now, where do you set these in your JSON file? So here at the bottom, you can set a preferred, uh, whoops, too much, preferred dark color theme and a preferred light color theme. If you're using high contrast, uh, it toggles from the current high contrast to the opposite high contrast. Uh, I believe that is that's the correct. Maybe I I don't know. I think I may have misspoke there, but it does work with high contrast themes. Is what I'm trying to say. Cool. So it's another one that you may have missed. You can quickly toggle between your themes. Um, how are we doing on time? You got time for a couple more? Yeah, yeah, we can do a couple more. All right. Um, another one, this one actually came out in this release is that when you rename a file, so in your, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but you can do, um, command zero puts the focus in the sidebar, which is quite handy because a lot of times you're moving the mouse from the sidebar to the editor and command one, will put it back in the editor group. I actually so didn't know that. Zero, yeah. Command one, command zero. All right. So if we're in here and we want to rename a file on, Windows, 
what is that, Olivia? What's the keyboard? Is it F2? F2. Mm -hmm. Okay. So on a Mac, it's just enter because that's how OS, Mac OS works. It's just enter to, uh, to rename any, any file anywhere. Um, but now if you continually press F2, it will select the whole thing, then just the extension, and then back to just the name. And you can just sort of like toggle through all this stuff. So it just makes it easier, right? Because if you're just trying to change the extension, it takes quite a few keyboard maneuvers to get to the end. Now you can just quickly move through that stuff just by pressing F2 over and over and over again. Nice. Uh, by the way, if you want to open a file on Mac and from the sidebar, it's command down, uh, which maybe isn't that intuitive. <laughs> I don't know why that's the case, but it is. All right. And then last, am I we're doing all right here? Yeah, right. you're good. So last is something that we did a short on that people really liked, and that's something called sticky scroll. Let's talk about sticky scroll. So when you have a lot of code, um, a lot of times like you'll get down so far into a class that you sort of lose track of where you are, right? Like what what class are you in? What function are you in? What are you what loop are you in? Right? These things get nested, and so it's hard to mm -hmm. it's hard to maintain your uh, you keep your keep your wits about you, and so we've and we've got this sticky scroll feature now. And what this does is, as you scroll, the context that you're in stays sticky. So I'm gonna I have to I have to scroll back up quite a ways here. But in this pull request provider, as I scroll down, that's now sticky. Now the constructor's sticky because we're there. Now this function's sticky. Right now this is sticky. So you can see that it just helps you to know where you actually are in the code. And you can click on these things. You were able to do this last time to go back to that specific place in the code. What's different now is that if you command click, so like this pull request model, if you hold command here or control and click, it will take you to that, the definition or the implementation of definition. Yeah, the definition of that specific item. So that's sticky scroll and what's new for sticky scroll, which is the navigation. We can I also love sticky scroll. I feel like it's one of those things that just like, you don't realize how great it is. You're like, oh, like that seems like a small thing or something. And then you use it like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Yeah, it's very cool. And it doesn't work everywhere, but it's working in more and more places. So like another one is in the package JSON file. So in this case, in the case of this file, this is the VS Code GitHub issues and pull request extension, pull request and issues extension, by the way. And you can see that as I scroll down, it's making these things sticky in the JSON file. So I can actually see where I am. Um, I don't think this works in HTML yet, although I'm hopeful that it might at some point in the future. But um, if you've got questions about that, you can check out the VS Code repo. There's tons of issues on sticky scroll, lots of people wanting it to do lots of things so yeah sticky scroll yes awesome we already have sticky scroll is the best agreed um which language and file support sticky scroll i'm sure we probably have documentation for that but burke do you know off the top of your head uh yeah again i would i would advise going to the github repo github.com slash microsoft slash vs code go to issues look for sticky scroll and there is an there's an issue open i think for testing sticky scroll right now i know it works for javascript typescript it works like in package json but i don't think it works in like in just straight up json files i don't know that it works for c plus plus yet so again I don't have a clear answer on that, but I would check the GitHub repo. Yeah, for sure. And keep in mind, this is something that came out for the first time, what, like two releases ago, I think. Um, so it's always something that we're looking to improve, um, but we've gotten great feedback from what currently exists. So I'm sure we will see some more of these file types supported. Awesome. Okay, you got anything right. else for us, Burke? That's it. Uh, cool. Chat, if y'all liked, we can come back and do this every now and again, mm -hmm. where we just sort of like do a roundup of the stuff you might have missed if you enjoyed it. Let us know in the comments if you never want to see me again. That, that's fine too. Just let me know. So we just want to banish Burke from these. Right. Yeah. All right, perfect. And we made it on the cellular connection. So I know fine. it was perfect. Good, good times. All right. Thanks so much, Burke. Thank you for having me. Bye, of chat. Course. Good to see you. And next up, we're going to have Henning to talk to us about three way merge. 
Um, so this is something that came out for the first time, I think one or two releases ago, right, Henning? And we got yes. some cool updates this, this update as well. Yeah, thanks for having me here. I'm super excited to talk about the Merge Editor. Yeah. Um, first, I wanted to say thanks for all the tons of feedback that we received for the Merge Editor. Even though it was mostly negative, but it's exactly what we need to make VS Code um, and the Merge Editor awesome. Yes, I think it's a great call out for, you know, we listen to all of y'all's feedback. We read the GitHub issues. We read your Twitter comments, right? And we're always looking to improve everything. Um, yes. So yeah, yeah. What you got for us today, Henny? Yeah, I prepared a, a small demo. Let me uh, share my screen. So uh, let's say today is code cleanup day. We have this index file here, and we see this, uh, this lead here, and the lead over there, and the lead in, in line 26. And we want to uh, replace that with a const. And then also, let's say uh, this print message is a weird name. Let's call this uh, print welcome. And let's let's see what else we can do. So there is um, this function get lines length here, and this is also a weird name. Uh, let's call this get line count. So I, I'm doing some renames, some some code cleanup, and also I see how some data is being computed here. Uh, I actually want to write this data on disk, so I use this write file sync, and now um, these code automatically on the TypeScript import, edit this import, and now I can see actually Copilot uh, completes the rest from this, which, which is super awesome. So now let's call it a day and um, commit my changes. So I call this refactor. I click the commit button, wait for it to commit. And now I can see this sync button, but what is this? So I see there are two incoming changes. So let's click on it and see what happens. Oh gosh, my day is ruined. Lots Threaded of merge conflicts. Merge conflicts. <laughs> yeah, they, they are always, they always make me nervous. So and uh, the, the, all of the file is full of these, of these Git conflict markers. And this, by the way, is the old experience. I will talk about the new experience uh, in a moment. So let's let's try to actually resolve these, these conflicts. So in the top, you can see the crown change. And we added this, uh, rather TypeScript, added this write file sync import. And at the bottom, we don't have read file sync anymore, but it's now read file. And there is this new promise, promiseify import. So let's... Um, Take this write file sync, copy it. We take the um, the lower change, which is the incoming change. We can click this button here, and then I have to add this here. And I think this is now um, properly merged. Okay, so which was uh, it took me it took me a while to do that. So let's have a look at the next one. Okay, so I think this used to be print message, and this and the current change we renamed it to print welcome. If you still remember that. We also changed um, let to const. So these are the changes here. And let's see here, there's print header. And um, this await is new. So I think let's uh, start with the incoming change. And uh, now I forgot what I wanted to do. So actually, actually, let's start over. So I'm going to reset um, the, the conflict markers because I, I got lost in them and I didn't, I didn't get it. And um, there is this, this new button here, open merge editor. So now I can open this file as it is in this new merge editor. Cool. And now at, at first glance, uh, this looks even more confusing, but but uh, be with me. I will uh, I will show you what you can do here. And I will show you that it's now much easier to, to resolve all these conflicts. So first, um, it's a three-way merge editor, which means it uses the incoming changes or the, the file after the incoming changes were applied. The, the current file, and it also uses the base file. The base file is the state of the file before both changes. So it's, it goes past to the history, and then it tries to see what are the changes in the current base to that, to that base, or to, to the history, to the initial version. And it then here sh shows the change of, of the incoming thing. And down here, we have the result file. And the, uh, the initial content of this result file is actually um, the exact file on disk. So if I go to the old experience or to this inline experience, so we are not we are not we are not going to deprecate this this inline experience. This inline experience will stay, and actually there is this button here that you can use uh, to to go back to this inline experience, and there is this button here, open merge editor. You can click that, and then you will will end up here again. So if I make a, a change now here, for example, like this, you can see it actually shows up here too. So these, these are synced and uh, you can use them vice versa. 
The only thing that we do in the result view is we hide the conflict markers. You can see there are these, these yellow boxes which um, with the conflicting line counts. And uh, this, these are the conflict markers, but, um, but um, we hide the content in between because we have this incoming and current view at the top uh, to show what is there. So let's have a look at the first, um, first conflict. You can see these check boxes, and you can see, also see this, this yellow border. And these indicate unhandled conflicts. You can also see we have five conflicts remaining. And we can now use these check boxes to accept the changes. So initially, there are these conflict markers. And if we start accepting one side, uh, these conflict markers will be, be replaced. So let's say I accept the current side. Then you can see uh, the conflict markers got removed also in this, in this file and disk. There are no conflict markers at, at the bottom anymore, at the top, sorry. And uh, now this write file sync change is actually now added to here. I can also undo that. And then um, this, this conflicting range will be reset to, to this base version. So the initial version that uh, has neither the current changes or the incoming changes. So this is what we started with and then in current, I added this write file sync import, and I can use the checkbox um, to add that. Now, what I can do now is I can also check the, the checkbox on the other side, which um, that changed read file sync to just read file, and also added this uh, promisify import. And now, magically, these both changes are merged. Nice. So now it's, um, yeah, you can easily um, check these checkboxes, and uh, you don't, you don't, you, you don't have to um, um, to copy lines or stuff. Though I have to say this only works in um, in these common easy cases. So, so sometimes when you have a super complex uh, merge conflict, uh, then um, you can't combine them that easily. Okay. So in that case, would you do more of like the manual process? Yeah, so you can always um, just edit the result directly. And now you can okay. also see if I um, if I remove this import and um, Remove this right file sent back. Um, then, and if I delete this line, okay, that, uh, and you can't see what I wanted to demo. I guess it's not fully demo day today. Uh, the, the demo gods run with, with me. Uh, but yeah, you can always just directly edit edit the the result, and um, the checkbox will reflect that. So if I copy this and replace this, then um, you can see the checkbox updated okay. to reflect that you took that side. And if I now at this here manually, uh, then you can see now both checkboxes are checked again. So even if you you know do have one of those really complicated merges or anything, you can still benefit from this view because you do kind of still have a clear of okay, this was what was previous, this is what's incoming, um, and kind of not get as confused as maybe in one yes, all in one file. You don't have to use the checkboxes; you can just just type mm -hmm. them. But these checkboxes, especially for these easy conflicts, mm -hmm. are, are very easy. Uh, uh, yeah. Right, just click and we're good just to go. Mm -hmm. So here you can see um, this um, is not a conflict. This is actually so in line three on the um, on the right. Um, this is a change that just has been made in current, but uh, this line has not been touched in incoming. So this is why there is no no checkbox on, on, okay. the, on the line. And um, yes, and it's automatically checked. The same as, as here, where uh, where async has been already commit, committed, so um, this checkbox is checked, and there is no way to to do something on the right because there was no change in current at, at, at this position. Okay, so you don't have to. It's not going to like excessively flag things, right? It's still going to just flag, you know, what those actual conflicts are. Yes. Okay. Um, so next, we have this rename where we can just say we want to keep, we want to stick with print welcome, so we accept this. And then here, uh, let got changed to const, and um, await got inserted. So here we can just get the await in, and here we can uh, replace the let with the const. So this conflict is handled. Let's go to the next one. There, by the way, there are these these handy buttons here that you can use uh, to to jump to the next um, unhandled um, conflict that needs to be resolved. So this is the rename where we wanted to choose the print welcome, and here. Gosh, this is a more complex uh, case, but here still const let got repl got replaced with const, and uh, there is this rename here get line count, which was um, was get lines count here, but uh, we renamed it to get line count. So let me just accept this side, and here some 
async stuff got in. So this is the incoming change that we didn't do. Someone else did that. And um, they also reformatted that, that thing. But even here, we can accept both sites and um, it gets merged correctly. OK, cool. And that actually was the last conflict. So now I can just click Accept Merge, and I'm done. Nice. So it's commit, and now it's uh, good to go to publish my changes. Cool. I love that because I feel like it just helps visualize it so much because merge conflicts get so confusing, especially when you have a ton and they're like slightly off and you're trying to figure out the best way. And then, like you said before, you might like accidentally copy and then you're or paste and then you're like, wait, what did I have before? And then it's just a whole headache and then your code's broken and no one wants that. <laughs> yeah, especially for, for simple merge conflicts, like when, when someone imports something and you also imported something at the same line, then these checkbox really help to quickly uh, go through all these, these conflicts. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, you can always go back to the uh, to the old uh, to the inline experience by pressing this button, and um, yeah, but uh, we are also actively working on improving the merge editor. We listen to your feedback, and uh, we know there are some things that are really confusing, and we are we are adding some uh, documentation and also thinking of, of ways how we can make it less confusing. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Let us know your feedback. Um, one question I had, Henning, and really it was a question I think I saw on Twitter that I think maybe some people might have as well. Um, the three-way merge view is kind of horizontal by default, but I think there's a mm -hmm. way to configure it to maybe be vertical if you yeah, want. Yeah, there's, so, there's okay. actually a way. So let me go back to the um, to the merge conflict. Um, so here there is. Um, and these three dots, there's this toggle that you can use to, to toggle between the mixed layout that has these uh, result, where the result editors at the bottom, but you can also switch to column layout, and then you have all three edits, editors uh, next to each other. OK, cool. So then it's like left, right, and then the center is that result. Yes. Cool. And um, if you want to see the base, there is, uh, there's a feature request that's, that has been implemented already in the insiders version of this code. And then, you have the option here to show the base version. Then you can easily compare uh, the, the right and left side with uh, what was originally there. Awesome. OK, one, one question we have um, is if you can compare different branches or if this is just for you know merge conflicts on your existing branch. No, it's just for merge conflicts. OK, that um, makes sense. Yeah. Cool. All right, well, definitely let us know what y'all think about this feature. Um, like Henning said, always working to improve it. Um, I personally love it. I think it's really intuitive um, to kind of see the before after and then, you know, just kind of mess around really quickly. And it's also a lot easier if you make a mistake to just uncheck that box. And then you're like, okay, everything's good. <laughs> Thanks. But still, there's there's lots of stuff to do. Mm -hmm. And merge conflicts, unfortunately, are always quite complex. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's lots of complicated algorithms are involved. And it's uh, very tricky to get that right, unfortunately. For sure. Cool. All right. Anything else you want to add, Henning? No, I think um, that was the merge editor, and cool. uh, you, um, you can be, you can accept, uh, you can uh, wait for great improvements here. Awesome! Thank you so much for coming on and showing that feature. Everyone in chat, definitely try that out. Let us know what you think. Um, and yeah, we're looking forward to seeing what else is new for it in future releases. Yeah, thanks for Thank having you so me. Much, Henning. All right. So then, last but not least, our final segment is kind of a two-parter. Um, and David, at the very start, I think that you um, kind of foresaw this, that we're going to be doing a spotlight on what's new in Jupyter Notebooks. And you were right. Um, so to kick us off for that, we're going to bring on Rob to do a little intro to Jupyter Notebooks and a couple of things there. Hey, Rob. Yes, hello. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for Good. coming on. Excited to see what you have. Yeah, this is my first release party, and I'm really excited to be Woo! here. Woo! I love that. Yeah, I love bringing on new people and seeing all this. And I think everyone in chat loves to see the actual engineers who are working on this, right? Um, but it's such a cool opportunity to get to interact with you and just hear you know, your thoughts on everything and see those features demoed firsthand. Great. Cool. Yeah, all right, having... so what do you have for us today? Yeah, so I'm going to talk about notebooks. And we haven't had the chance to talk about notebooks in the release party before. so. I figured I could start out with just sort of a general overview of like what notebooks are for people who haven't been exposed to them before, uh, make sure we're on the same page, and then we can get into some of the things that we have been working on um, over the past couple months after that. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Let's bring on your screen, and then we can get going. Um, 
You might need to reshare your screen, Rob. I'm not sure that I'm seeing it in the background. Okay. All right. Let's see. Okay, can you see that? Yep. Okay. And there we are. Cool. Okay, cool. Yeah, so, so notebooks basically are sort of an interactive computing environment. Uh, you get a document which combines rich text as markdown. So for example, these um, cells are markdown cells, and I can double click these to edit them and, and see the markdown source or um, click the checkbox to, to see the, the rendered markdown results. Um, so it combines markdown with uh, code cells, and I can actually run the code cells and then see the results all in line in one document. Uh, so, for example, just uh, giving a really a really quick example here. If I um, run this code cell, this is running some Python code using the Jupyter Notebook system. And uh, if I have a basic expression here, it'll execute that and show the result. So I could use this as a little uh, just sort of Python calculator. Um, and I will also show you sort of how I got into this if, if you want to try it. Um, the, the first thing I did was install the Jupyter extension. So I just go to the extension marketplace. Uh, I can search for Jupyter and um, find the Jupyter extension here. I install that. And then I can go to the, the file menu, say file and new file, and find Jupyter Notebook. And this opens an empty Jupyter Notebook, which is ready for me. And I picked my Python environment. Um, and then you're ready to go. Um, and I will just stick to this notebook that I have, have prepared already. Um, so that's one really simple example. Um, another thing that I sort of wanted to emphasize is that when I'm running these code cells, I'm actually working against a live stateful Python environment. Meaning, you know, for example, if I run some code which assigns a variable, well, now that variable is, is living inside this, this Python kernel that I'm attached to, and I can reference that variable in another code cell. So if I go and run this code cell, then it, it has that variable. Um, if I change this to something else and, and run that, then that variable being updated. Um, and so it's it's kind of similar to if you have worked with the Python REPL in a, in a terminal um, where you're actually connected to sort of a, a live environment. And uh, something else that I wanted to, to tell you about notebooks is that these outputs that we see don't have to just be text. They can be images. They can be graphs and charts um, or videos. Um, we even have, it can be, you know, interactive, um, 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 widgets that sort of give you other like sliders to change the values of different variables and, and other things like that. And so just as a really quick example, um, this cell will um, actually download an image and, and display that image as an output. So here's an example of, of an output that can be an image as well. Nice. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, Jupyter Notebooks can do so much. And if you're into data science, you know that. Um, but I think there's also a ton of benefit in what Rob is showing with these really simple examples. Um, because one thing that I really like to use notebooks for is if you're ever doing any sort of demo or any sort of teaching or anything like that, this is a great way to be like, okay, let's do an interactive cell and see what the output's going to be for this. Um, and then you can, you know, check in that notebook file into source control. People can pull it down, mess around with it. Um, so even though we are doing basic things in here, that just this basic stuff is still incredibly helpful for so many use cases. Yeah, exactly. So I also wanted to show a, a more complex example. And um, so you can see that we're actually in a code space for the stable diffusion uh, GitHub repo. Um, so stable diffusion, if you haven't heard of it, is a tool that uses AI to generate images from text prompts. Um, so if you've heard of Dolly, um, or there's a few other sort of similar tools that have been uh, getting some attention lately, especially on Twitter, you see all these cool images that people are generating with these tools. Um, stable diffusion is it an one of those an example of one of those tools which uh, you can actually run yourself and uh, someone on my team Joao, was able to make a notebook which interacts with with uh, stable diffusion and lets you you know write text prompts and run them through the system and then see the outputs um, in line um, so how this notebook works is essentially we have this longer code cell here which I, I won't try to, to explain every line of it. But the important thing is that it sets up the stable diffusion system, and then it finds this, this run function, which takes a prompt as a string and sends it into stable diffusion, and then displays the output um, as a, an image. Um, I won't run this cell again. I already ran it. It takes a minute to run. Um, but uh, to give some examples, now we have this run function. And I can um, pass some prompt into here. And since it is morning here and I am thinking about breakfast right now, I want to start out by looking at some of my 
favorite pictures of breakfast foods, I guess. Um, you have to start out with coffee, of course. So let's see whether it can give us a, Ooh. a picture of... Okay, so, so, so I'll, I'll say with, with systems like this, essentially this is an AI system that's been trained on billions of images that's sort of gotten a sense of what different types of things look like and what they look like in different contexts. The image that it's generating right now is, it's not Google, it's not searching for an image on the internet that matches this query. It's generating an entirely new image from scratch that has never been before seen by human eyes. And so sometimes you get things which are sort of exactly what you expect, and sometimes you get stuff which is a little weird. So let's try another one and see. Oh, okay. yeah. So this that's one I like better. That's, that's, yeah. that's a nice looking French press. I would drink yeah. that. OK, I need some pancakes uh, also to go with my coffee. This stuff is so cool to me. Like, I wish I was a data scientist so I could understand everything that's going on with this. Yeah, those are some nice looking, nice looking pancakes. Yeah, this would make me hungry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, Ooh. this one's better. That's good. Oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> and we'll see if we can get something out of here, too. Oh, if the healthy breakfast is going to look any better than the pancakes, I'm not sure. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so going with pancakes for sure. <laughs> okay, we've got some fruit. I, I don't know what all this stuff is. It sort of looks like an alien breakfast, but uh, <laughs> I'm gonna stick with pancakes. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so some, some things that are, are sort of newer that I'd like to point out here are, uh, so let's say I am running a cell. And um, so you can see we have the outline over here and I have this sort of divided into sections and you can see items for the code cells. Um, as this cell is running, we actually draw this animated spinner icon to show you which cell is running. And we're sort of trying to help you, you know, keep a little more context and sort of keep your place in, in the notebook. So, if, you know, maybe if you scroll around, you can um, you can still see which where, where the running cell in the notebook is. Um, and you also get the same thing in the breadcrumbs view. So if you're if you're clicking through here, you can see that this the cell is running. Awesome. And uh, so also, if you if you start running a cell and, you know, let's say you, you scroll away from it, we now have this go to button with the spinning icon. And so if I if I click on that, it's going to jump back to the cell that's running. Uh, and reveal that cell. So um, that's also something that I, I find pretty useful sometimes as I'm like executing cells and scrolling around in the notebook at the same time. Yes, very handy. Yes, and and something else that's useful is you know let's say I'm running a bunch of cells and so I'm just going to to run, let's say, I'll run every cell below here. Um, so again, we have these these spinning indicators, but if one of these cells fails, then this button is actually going to stick around and, and get a, a red button, a red indicator, um, because sometimes as I'm running through all the cells in a notebook, you know, at some point it, it stopped running and I'm not sure sort of where it stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you have to do the like manic scrolling, trying to figure out, and then you go too far, and then you yeah, go far enough. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You're scrolling all around looking for an error yeah. message. But here, we noticed that a cell failed, um, and so we can click this to jump straight to the cell that actually failed. And um, I, I see this one, so I actually had a, a typo here. Um, so I'm going to fix that, and now I can rerun the cell and, and continue running. Cool. And um, so also I will show you this prompt since someone uh, early in chat asked for soda for the party. So I was trying to see whether uh, Stable Diffusion could give us a picture of soda. Oh, nice. <laughs> it's, it's given us some pretty freaky looking soda. I don't know. Yeah. That I, soda. I don't want that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think Microsoft will get sued if we distributed that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was a little bit better. But, All right. Okay. Yeah, you, you can get the alien text kind of effect on it. So We're I'm getting gonna... there. <laughs> So uh, one more thing that I'd like to show is um, something that is sort of helpful for when you're working with um, code cells that are really long. So we've noticed that a lot of people are often sort of scrolling around in the in the code cell, and then they go down here and they're looking at the output, and then they want to rerun the cell. And um, what they used to have to do is you would have to scroll all the way to the top of the cell and find the run button and click that, and then scroll back down, or use keyboard shortcuts. Um, but now we actually sort of have this sticky scrolling effect on the run button and on the code toolbar. Um, so I can, even as I scroll around, these are always in the same place and uh, I can always find this and easily rerun the cell. Nice. Yeah, very helpful. Mm -hmm. Cool. So we have a couple questions um, in the chat. Um, 
One, there's a couple people mentioning other notebooks. So you've been talking about Jupyter notebooks. Does VS Code do any other sort of notebooks? Yeah, so VS Code basically has support for sort of a generic notebook API, and you can plug in different notebook systems to that. So Jupyter notebooks are one that we spent quite a lot of time on, but um, we have also supported a, a couple other different types of notebooks. Um, for example, there's the GitHub issue notebook. And what this lets you do is, is write code cells, which are like queries for GitHub issues. And then you can run it and, and get a result, which is sort of the, um, um, the, the search results from that query. Um, and so we use this a ton um, sort of internally in VS Code when we're just sort of managing our day-to-day our -day work and tracking different uh, issue queries. Um, another one that we have is called RESTbook. And this lets you write um, code cells, which are like um, um, REST API queries. And then you can get the, um, the output from that and the response headers. And it's, it's sort of like the, the Postman tool if you use that, but in notebook form. Cool. So each of these are in their own extension, basically. Uh -huh. Okay. Awesome. Okay. One other question we had before we see what Aaron has for us in the Jupyter world. Um, so he said, tried notebooks for the first time earlier this week. Would love to get support from more languages, though. So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about, you know, you're using Python right now. Are there other languages you can use with notebooks? What's the roadmap look like that? You know, all that good stuff. Yeah, so um, I, I'm showing Jupyter with Python. Um, you can also use Jupyter with, with kernels that give you support for different languages. Actually, Jupyter stands for Julia, Python, and R. Uh, so those are sort of the first class languages in, in the Jupyter system. Um, there's also a team at, at Microsoft which is working on um, a, a .NET based um, notebook system, which there's an extension for that, which, yeah, here it is, so .NET Interactive, which um, they support um, C Sharp and, and JavaScript and um, a, a bunch of different languages, actually. Um, so yeah, there's lots of work going on out there for different types of uh, notebooks. Cool. Yeah. And I know I've done one with C++ before, but it was because you can connect to a remote server from within VS Code. So I just used like this remote C++ kernel. I spun that up and then I was able to connect to it from within VS Code. So there's definitely ways that, you know, if you want to be in VS Code that you can connect to remote servers that you may have. Um, and then, like Rob said, there's you know plenty of other support that we can get, and there's some cool stuff in the roadmap. So we'll definitely, you know, as things come out, um, we'll keep you all updated um, through our documentation, and then hopefully have the team back on on a future release party too to talk about some stuff. Yeah. Cool. Anything else, Rob, that you want to mention? Um, I think that's it. Yeah, give give Netbooks a try and let us know how it goes. Cool. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah, um, so. Continuing on this notebook trend, we are going to close out with Aaron, who's going to show us some other cool things that came out in this update. Aaron. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. All right, so you got some more notebook goodness for us? Yes. Cool. Let's uh, see. Yeah, this this just one, one final feature that we have, um, kind of a markdown-based one. And this one was actually implemented by our summer intern, Michael, who just left recently, but now I get to show off his, his work that he's done. Nice. Uh -huh. uh, and this is also behind some experimental tags, so not quite finished. Well, it, it works well, but we're you know still finishing it up and mm -hmm. uh, finalizing the API and everything. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to show. First, we we kind of have the normal way of of adding an image to a Markdown cell, where we kind of have uh, we might just have an image in the workspace that we have. And the normal way to add, add an image to Markdown is just to kind of reference it through a, uh, a relative file path. So here I just have, you know, the images it's coming in from an image that's just locally available. Uh, so that was already implemented. But the new way of doing it is if, say, I just see an image on the web and I just can right click, copy image, and just paste it directly into the notebook cell. So now this this image doesn't live in my workspace. It actually exists inside the notebook. Uh, okay. And this is this is following <clears throat> the just the Jupyter notebooks feature from the web UI. So it's uh, and, and in that way, it is compatible with with Jupyter notebooks. So if I I can actually show that the image is in there. If I switch to the text editor, here's the actual image data just directly in the cell cell data. OK, cool. And, so you don't even have to have that locally whatsoever. You could, right, you yeah, it's, it just it. goes right into the notebook. 
awesome. So yeah, the, the source is just referencing that single attachment that's right there. Mm -hmm. Cool. And I think I saw that you can do this for screenshots too. Like if you're just doing like your clipboard or, you know, whatever the snipping tool or. Right. Yeah. So if I, is. yeah, just take a quick uh, snapshot of that. I can just copy that over and yeah, same thing. Just paste it right in there. Nice. That's so handy. And so does it always, um, I was just looking at that, what it came in is always kind of have that same naming structure where it's just like image, image two, image three. Right. Um, there are, I can't remember how it was, but there's some way of, maybe if I copy a file. Yeah, there it is. Oh no, that's, that's still just a, but there is some way of, of actually, it, I think if you copy a file from, from locally and paste it in, it will take that file name. But if, if okay. I'm just right clicking and, you know, copying a, a random image that doesn't really have a file backing to it, mm -hmm. then yeah, it'll just, it'll use the standard. Right. Cool. So, cool. That's really handy that you can just basically like embed it without needing it. You know right, what I mean? Yeah. That's awesome. And I'll just show one more example of if I have, say, I don't have as fancy as images as Rob does, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if I have, you know, some plot that I've generated and maybe I want to just save that save that image that I have, uh, if you ha as long as you have the correct MIME type selected, which for now we, we're only uh, supporting PNG uh, in Jupyter. But yeah, if you have PNG, then you can just copy that image using that copy button and same thing. It'll just it'll save that image that you had. Nice. Generated. Cool, this is great. Yep, and yeah, that's the image pasting feature. Cool. Um, so yeah, I just wanna reiterate, you know, a lot of times we have experimental features on um, these release parties. Definitely feel free to try them out, um, but always looking for feedback. Um, so, you know, if y'all are seeing something that you want to behave in a different way, just let us know in the repo. Um, but this is definitely a really cool feature that makes it, you know, if, if you're used to working with these notebooks, this saves a lot of time. And it's, it's definitely a feature that was very requested. Yes. <laughs> cool. All right. Anything else you want to add, Aaron? Uh, nope. That was it. Okay. All right. Well, in that case, just want to give a big thank you to all of the presenters today. So um, Burke, Rob, Henning, Aaron, really appreciate everything that y'all did today. Um, love having y'all come on and see all this. Um, Burke did kind of, you know, that lightning round of quick things you might miss in the last couple of releases. So if y'all are interested in seeing that, you know, maybe like every other release party or something like that, let us know. Um, and that's definitely something we can incorporate just to make sure some of these really cool features um, don't fall through the cracks and y'all get a chance to see them. Um, experiment, oh, there's actually one question here. So experimental means can only access in insiders. Um, not necessarily, it basically just means it's kind of still, you know, under construction, but in actual VS Code stable, you can try out these features. Um, there's just a couple of experimental settings that you then have to um, go ahead and enable. So I think it's for the um, notebook paste images experimental setting, and then the editor um, paste actions experimental setting. You can go ahead and try that out in stable. Um, but what experimental does mean is you might, you know, see a couple of issues with that and they might be actively being worked on in insiders. So um, they might just have, you know, be not quite as stable as a non-experimental feature. So great question. Okay. So um, once again, thank you all for coming on. Um, we love having these release parties. This will be available for you um, to stream on demand um, on our YouTube channel. So definitely make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to that. Um, and then we also are on TikTok. So feel free to check us out there to see some of the silly videos that we post. Um, and we will be posting one of those release highlight shorts this week. Um, so y'all can get, you know, 60 seconds or less, just a couple of quick um, snippets of some of the highlights, some that we saw today and some other ones that were not demoed today. Um, and with that, thank you all for coming and we will see you for next week's live stream. Happy coding.